Everyone, we're starting to the last section here, which is magnetism. We're going to start with magnetic fields. By the end of this unit, you should be able to look at this picture and explain exactly why this is happening and how these are caused. But, so in class today, we did a couple things with hands-on magnetic fields. We wanted to get you guys to experience where magnetic fields come from and how we can watch the forces that they exert on things. So we looked at a current carrying wire. We looked at bar magnets with attraction and repulsion, seeing if different metallic objects were magnetic and what happens when you cut a magnet in half. So with the first setup here we had a power supply attached to a light bulb. That light bulb had a wire that went straight through the page here and we put compasses around the setup. The, if you look all those compasses are pointing towards magnetic north, pointing towards the north pole because that's the magnetic field they're sensing at this time. So when we've talked about fields in the past we've said that field is created by something that it also affects like when we talked about gravity gravity was created by two masses masses attracting each other so gravity was created by mass and affects mass for electric fields to create an electric field you need an electric charge and that charge then affects other charges out there so the field that's created then affects other charges magnetism looks like it might be a little bit different here what we're seeing is that we've got the compasses pointing towards magnetic north so the earth is acting like a giant magnet but what people did is they ran experiments with electricity and had a compass nearby that wire so when I turn on the power supply here you can see that the light bulb does turn on which means currents flowing through that wire and in this case the current is flowing up and out of that wire and what happens when I start moving these little compasses near the wire you can see that the compasses no longer follow the Earth's magnetic field. They actually sense a new field that's around the wire. So when we have current carrying wires, or they create a new field that the compasses detect, and compasses detect magnetic fields, so that means that current carrying wires create magnetic fields. Moving charges create magnetism. So it's kind of opposite of what we've seen before. To have electric fields we need a charge, to have gravitational fields we need a mass, but to get magnetic fields you need charges in motion. And one other thing we do in this demo is we switch the current around. We see when the current shut off that all the compasses go back to pointing towards magnetic north again. We reversed the current going through the light bulb. The light bulb doesn't care which way electricity flows through it. But when we set it through in the opposite direction, now current going down through that wire into the page, you can see all the compasses now are reacting in the opposite direction. So we've got magnetic field forming these loops around current carrying wires. And the way we can define which way the magnetic field is going to go is with a right hand rule. So the first right hand rule here says that if you want to figure out the direction of the magnetic field, you put your thumb in the direction of the current. So your thumb goes in the direction of that wire, which way the current is going, out or in, and you curl your hand in the direction that the magnetic field is. So in this case, the current is out of the page, and you get a loop of magnetic field that goes counterclockwise. So the second thing we looked at in the lab was a permanent bar magnet. And when we looked at a permanent bar magnet, you guys noticed several things. A permanent bar magnet, or a compass, has two sides. It has a red side, which we call the north end, and it has a white side, which we call the south end. And when you move a permanent bar magnet near a compass, it reacts, and you see that opposite poles attract, and similar poles repel. That's why the north always attracts the white side, and the south attracts the red side. Now, if there's a magnet you don't have it labeled north and south, you can use the compass to tell you which side is north and which side is south. Just using the compass, you can see that with those little small magnets, they do have two poles north and south. But one thing that was odd with the permanent bar magnet, we said that to create magnetic fields, we needed moving charges. We saw moving charges in the wire, and we saw that we had magnetic fields. But in a permanent bar magnet, we put a voltmeter across it, and we got no potential. No potential means no electric field, and if there's no electric field through that metal, then there's no current. So a permanent bar magnet seems very, very weird. It seems like it shouldn't have any magnetism because we don't have moving charges. So some of the observations we saw that the magnetic field always occurs in pairs. Uh, like poles repel and opposite poles attract, just like in charges. The 
compass will align with the direction of the magnetic field. And we have a new vector now we'll call vector B, which will represent the strength of the magnetic field. So like electric fields, magnetic fields will have a strength and a direction. They're strong when you're close to the magnet and they're weaker when you're further away from the magnet. The direction then depends on if you're dealing with a current wire where we use the right hand rule to tell you which way the magnetic field is pointing. We said that magnetic fields form in loops, in closed loops, and need moving charges. So when we look at a permanent bar magnet here, we can see that there are lines of force going out of the North Pole and coming back in the South Pole. So they actually do create a closed loop if you complete that loop through the middle of the bar magnet. Another thing we did in the lab was put iron filings on top of a magnet. If you sprinkle on those iron filings, you can see that the filings kind of line up like test charges with the magnetic field. And you can see the field lines arc from one end of the magnet towards the other end of the magnet. In this example, I put another magnet underneath the paper, and when I put on the iron filings here, you can see that it's actually a horseshoe magnet. It's really a bar magnet that we bent into a U shape. And you can see that we get curved magnetic field lines and where the field lines are densest are where the magnetic fields are strongest. So for the permanent bar magnets, they do still have closed loops of magnetic field just like a current wire. The field does decrease with distance. The direction for the magnetic field points in the same direction that a magnetic field loop forms around a current wire. But the moving charges, that's the thing that kind of bothers people, that there is no moving charges. But what they're not thinking of is what it's made of of the atoms that are inside of it. So for a very crude model of the atom, we have our positive nucleus in the middle with our protons, and we have our electrons that move and orbit outside. So we do have charges that are in motion here. They're actually the electrons that are inside the metals. So you think, well, then every atom should be magnetic. Well, one thing that electrons do besides orbit is they also have a spin. So each electron has an orbital spin whether it spins up or down, and when it does that, that spin creates the magnetism. So it creates a north pole one way and a south pole the other way. But most electrons are paired. There's usually two electrons in every pair, and the other electron has the opposite spin, creating a magnetic field in the opposite direction, so most atoms are neutrally magnetic. They don't have any net magnetism. However, if you look at the atoms of iron, nickel, and cobalt, their outermost electron is unpaired. And with that unpaired electron, you do get atoms to line up and have lots of magnetic fields pointing in the same direction. So what happens when we try to split a magnet? So when you try to break a magnet in half and get a north and a south end by itself, every time we split the magnet, you actually get two new norths and souths. So you actually can never isolate just a North Pole or a South Pole. So looking at the broken magnets again, if I bring the other half of the broken magnet close to it, it will realign itself and create one large magnet again. So like you can see here in the FET demonstration, we've got a compass that you can move around the magnet, and you can see how the red end is the north end of the compass and the white end is the south end. As I move it around, you get the magnetic field to point in opposite directions. If I could see inside the magnet, you could see that actually there are magnetic field lines that go all the way through and complete that closed loop. So away from north and in towards south. So even if I break this magnet in half, I'm going to get a new north and a new south. So what does the compass respond to when there isn't a magnet present? Well, it responds to the Earth. And the Earth can be seen as one giant bar magnet. And if our red end points towards geographic north, that must mean there's a magnetic south pole all the way at the top of the Earth. And even when you look at this picture of the magnetic field lines, if I would cut straight down the middle for this magnet, you can still see that there are field lines that are pointing away on this end and field lines that are coming in on this side. So you create new north and south every time you split a magnet. There's no way we can create just a monopole. So with the Earth being a giant bar magnet, what we do notice is that every couple hundred thousand years or so, the magnetic polarity flips. And what that does is all that's going to happen is our compasses will point in the other direction. So you're going to see the north end of the compass then point towards the actual south pole and the south end point to the actual north pole. And how do we even know that these flips even happened? 
Well, it comes from a little bit of geology, where having moving or molten rock. So, if moving charges create magnetism, then what about a moving charge that's near a magnetic field? You've got three charges here, one that's stationary, one that's moving along the field lines, and one that's moving across the field lines. Which one of these is gonna feel a force due to the magnetic fields? Well, to try to explain this, we have to look at a cathode ray tube. And what a cathode ray tube is, what we talked about way back in the electricity section, we said that's how the old TVs worked and the old computer monitors. They fire electrons from the back of the screen, they hit the front of the screen, and to hit the top corner of the screen, they're deflected by electric fields. And the electric fields bend the beam of charges so that they go up and strike the screen and illuminate the screen where you want the certain color. We can use a cathode ray tube, instead of using it as a television to produce a nice color pictures, we can use a cathode ray tube that looks like this. In this picture, the box here is creating a beam of electrons that are hitting the main screen. So what we did at the end of the hands-on magnetism lab is we said that let's call the electron beam heading straight out towards the screen as having electrons moving in the positive K direction, leaving your screen. And what we're gonna do in each trial, and what we did in each trial is we brought a magnet close to that beam of electrons. In each trial, we brought different ends of the magnet. So in this case, a north pole headed towards the beam of electrons. Now a south pole is heading towards the beam. And when we have the magnetic fields interacting with a beam of charge, take this one for example, we've got the magnetic field pointing towards the right. That means that the magnetic field's pointing in the positive I direction. We've got the beam of electrons in the positive K direction. So watch where the beam gets deflected. As that magnet approaches, you can see the beam is dropping down. It's feeling a down force. As the south pole approaches, you're now seeing an up force on that beam of electrons. So it looks like the direction of the magnetic field, the direction of the moving charge, and the direction of the force are all at right angles to each other. So what does that mean for us? That means that the force acting on moving charges acts, the charge moves across the field lines. For electricity, we had to move with the field lines to feel a force. But now, with magnetic fields, charges need to move at 90 degrees to the magnetic field to feel the force. So if you took that magnet and went straight at the cathode ray tube, those charges wouldn't deflect at all. Which means we have to look at these things moving due to a right hand rule. A second right hand rule that we're used to seeing when we talked about torques and angular momentum. I'll leave a link for IJK review over how you get each of those setups. Yes, you can use the wheel for IJK, but the force that charges feel in a magnetic field is a cross product. Now what does that cross product depend on? That cross product does depend on three things. The charge that's in the field, the speed at which that charge moves, and the magnetic field itself. Magnetic fields only exert forces on charges when they move across them perpendicularly. So our equation will be this. The force will be QV cross B. V being the velocity of the charge and B being the magnetic field strength. Now we do have units for all this. The magnetic field strength is measured in Teslas. A Tesla of magnetic field strength is one Newton per one amp times meters. So let's make sure we do get a Newton in the end if we analyze our units. So we want to make sure we get force. Charge is easy. Charge is measured in coulombs. Velocity, that's easy. It's meters per second. And then we multiply by the Tesla. That's one Newton per amp times meter. So now if we look at this, we can get rid of the meter very, very easily. But what about the amp? Well, an amp is a charge per second, and we're left with a charge per second. So technically, we have an amp on top and an amp on the bottom, so we are left with a Newton in the end. So at the end of class, we handed out this page, and I want you to practice how the moving charge feels forces due to these different magnetic fields. So the lines that you're seeing here, like in the first two, the down arrows and the up arrows, those represent the magnetic field strength. I am giving you the sign of the charge, the positive charge, and the direction of its velocity. So if I do 
Scenario number one here, let's zoom in on it. Since magnetic force is Q, V, cross, B, I have to look at the direction for each of those and V cross B is a cross product. So you can see that my velocity is in the positive I direction and I'm crossing that with a magnetic field and that magnetic field is in the negative J direction. So I cross a negative J is gonna give me a force. Again, put your fingers this time in the direction of the moving charge, in the direction of velocity, curl your hands in the direction of the magnetic field and your thumb will produce the magnetic force. So in this case V cross B is going to give me a force that is into the page. And for us into the page is in the negative K direction. So this charge would actually bend and move away from you once it enters that magnetic field. So what's going on with these ones down here that have X's and dots? Well to represent magnetic field coming at you Think of an arrow flying straight at your face. When an arrow is flying straight at your face, you would actually only see the tip of the arrow right before it hits your eye. So technically, all of these magnetic fields are magnetic fields coming out of the page towards you. On the other side, when you see the X's, if you'd fire an arrow away from you and they hit a target, you'd see the feathers on the end of the arrow. So those X's represent magnetic field going into the page. So since we've got to draw three dimensional vectors we're showing into the page to be the X's, out of the page to be the dots, or like you see in this example here, I'm telling you that the charge is moving into the page. So that charge is flying away from you, the magnetic field in that case is down. So practice through these problems using your right hand rule. Remember, your hand in the direction of velocity, curl in the direction of the magnetic field, and your thumb gives you the force the charge will feel as it enters magnetic fields only if the charge is moving perpendicular to the field. So good luck, and we'll talk next time.